event has been years in the making. Um, I first met um, Mr. Davis in 2014, I think it was August, um, when I accompanied sort of in an unofficial capacity, a delegation of US civil society to um, the United Nations in Geneva. Um, and I remember um, and at the time sort of, um, we just watched the documentary, which I'm sure um, shook a lot of people. Um, and so at the time, like there was a time right between a mistrial and the retrial um, um, of um, Michael Dunn. And um, Ron was in Geneva to testify at the United Nations, right? And spoke much about the absurdities of um, the stand your ground laws. And I, um, I just have like, I have fond memories of just meeting, um, meeting Ron Davis, like at breakfast every morning, we would look out the window. Um, I was a PhD student, so I would like try to figure out um, what was the villa where um, Mary Shelley sort of conceived of Frankenstein, by we plotted if we could actually sneak off one afternoon and get to the foot of the Mont Blanc, um, if that was somehow feasible, right? Um, so there was, I have some fond memories, but there was also like, there was a darkness right around that time because um, in the evenings when we got back to the hotel, we would turn on the TV, right? And we got images from Ferguson, Missouri, where um, Mike Brown had been shot and killed and his body, you know, was left to lie in the street for, for hours, right? And people were rising up. Um, so there was all of that going on at the time. And because I was a PhD student, I was actually, I had just read um, Malcolm X's 1964 journals, which sort of chronicle his, his time in Cairo, right? Um, and the Middle East and sort of Africa in, in 1964 after he breaks of the nation of Islam. Um, and there was actually something I wanted to show you about that. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen for a moment. Um, I think I should be able to do this. Um, he published an article in the Egyptian Gazette. So Malcolm X published an article in the Egyptian Gazette, um, which I find is sort of noteworthy. Um, I think you're all looking at it right now. Um, it, it was called um, Racism, the Cancer that is Destroying America. It was published in 64, um, I think in August. Um, he wrote it a little bit earlier. And in it, he sort of makes that case for human rights. Um, and he says at one point, he says, so he's moving away from a civil rights at the very moment that, you know, like sort of major um, civil rights organization in America pushing for the Civil Rights Act, right? He's actually moving the goalposts somewhere else. And he says the common goal of 22 million Afro-Americans is respect as human beings, the God-given right to be a human being. Um, our common goal is to obtain the human rights that America has been denying us. We can never get civil rights in America unless our, until our human rights uh, are first restored. We will never be recognized as citizens. Therefore, uh, there until we are first recognized as humans, right? And then he goes on. I just highlighted a few um, sections, but it's it's an essay that I think you know you all might want to read at some point. Um, he said, in the past, civil rights groups in America have been foolishly attempting to obtain constitutional rights from the same government that has conspired against us to deny our people these rights. Only a world body, a world court, can be instrumental in obtaining these rights, rights which belong to a human being by dint of his being a member of the human family. Um, and then one last quote I wanted to add to this, he says, but once our struggle is lifted from the confined civil rights label to the level of human rights, our freedom struggle has then become internationalized. And so as a, as a you know, I, I just read, um, read that essay and, and a few more of his um, journal entries, right? Um, as, a, as I was sort of, you know, like as I met um, Ron and um, also the mother of Trayvon Martin, who was there at the same time to testify at the United Nations and everything seemed like eerily, um, awfully relevant again, by 50 years after, after the fact that um, Malcolm had been to, to, um, to Egypt and, and, and thought about these things. Um, during his time in Egypt, um, Malcolm was actually, he was accepted as an observer to the first ordinary session um, of the Organization of African Unity, which convened in Cairo in July of 1964. And as an observer, he was actually allowed to submit um, to submit notes or um, a memorandum to, to, the, to the conference. Like he was not allowed to speak, but he was allowed to submit a written uh, memorandum, um, which he called the Appeal to African Heads of State. Um, and in which he asked African nations like decolonizing sort of countries in the Middle East and, and Africa to support the struggle for human rights in the United States. Um, so all of that seemed like eerily present by right, the moment I, I first met um, Ron Davis. And I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna briefly sort of make one more remark because um, last summer, right, after the murder of George Floyd, um, there, was, um, there was a moment in, in, in America sort of where major civil rights organizations, including um, the one that um, Mrs. Henkin is representing here, the 
uh, United States uh, US um, Human Rights Network and the ACLU drafted a letter to the UN Human Rights Council asking for a commission to be convened to investigate police killings in the United States. And that letter was then taken on by the African Union um, where you know, like the nations sort of in the African Union sort of supported a claim and brought it up to the United Nations. Um, on June 19th um, of last year of 2020, the Human Rights Council adopted a historic resolution actually condemning racism in the United States, which doesn't happen very often. And I wanna briefly look at sort of that resolution because it's quite interesting. Um, and again, you can, you can find it online. Um, it, it cites sort of, you know, as a rationale, most sort of, of the, um, you know, major sort of human rights treaties, right? Um, but then also like, so you go down, you get to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, CERD, right? The um, Convention for the Elimination of um, All Forms of Racial Discrimination and, and, and Torture. But then um, on the second page, and this is quite interesting, there's actually on the second page is a reference to that very um, convening of the African uh, Organization of African Unity in, in Cairo in 1964, the very event that Malcolm X sort of attended, right? Um, and actually says it's taking note. So the resolution from last year is actually taking note of the historic resolution on racial discrimination in the United States of America adopted at the first ordinary session, you know, and so on. Um, and so I want to, you know, it's interesting to go actually back to the document, right? The document that was adopted in 1964. Um, and it mostly sort of, if you, if you scan through the pages, again, it, it can be found online. It's mostly sort of about concerns of, um, of a decolonizing continent, right? Um, there's, you know, like border disputes between African states, but in the, in the middle of it, right? And because of Malcolm X's work, because of him coming to Cairo and making a case for um, the need for a human rights sort of recognition of, of, um, of African-American sort of um, struggles, right? In the middle of that resolution that was passed in Cairo, you actually find uh, a condemnation sort of of the racial oppression against African-Americans in the United States. Um, and it was such a seminal sort of moment that it's cited again in the resolution from last year. And it's sort of, um, it's worthy to note that um, as Malcolm X's sort of family tells us, not only was Malcolm sort of, did Malcolm die briefly after he brought sort of an African-American struggle to an international audience, right? But his very father died collecting signatures for, to bring the case of African-Americans to the League of Nations, right? So there's a long sort of struggle of, um, of people who, you know, like, like Ron did too, right? Like find sort of run into major obstacles, getting justice in the United States and then have to go abroad to seek that kind of justice. Um, and I thought that was like, you know, worthy of us to acknowledge um, that um, there's also a long legacy of um, human rights sort of activists from the United States actually addressing Egyptian audiences, which Ron is doing right now, right? We had the whole Du Bois family, um, W.B. Shirley and um, her son Graham live in, a, in Cairo in the 60s as Malcolm X, as Maya Angelou, right? Um, Angela Davis had, had moments where she spoke to Egyptian audiences about both racism in the United States and about um, issues in Egypt, right? Um, Cornel West has been here. So I think Ron follows in a long sort of lineage of um, American human rights activists who come and actually engage an Egyptian audience. Um, so that was my, my background. And I just wanna briefly sort of um, thank the people who made this possible, right? Um, as I said before, Mrs. Omneya Ali has worked very tirelessly to, to make sure there's no glitches. And um, I don't know, she is probably sleep deprived right now as some of us are. I want to thank our two fellows who are here today, Aya um, Altamizani um, and Nada Ibrahim, who are you know pulling the strings behind behind Zoom and, and again ensuring that there's no glitches. Um, I want to thank the president for being here um, and agreeing to welcome um, Mr. Davis. Um, and then um, Mrs. Salima Hankins is going to be here to give us a more proper introduction about exactly sort of what what kind of work he does and you know like um, how he contributes greatly to, to the struggle. And then um, I also wanna thank um, Professor Doris Jones for agreeing to, um, to run the Q&A, the discussion afterwards. Um, I think she's the perfect person to do so because um, she has great experience interviewing people. So um, yeah, thank you everybody for, for being here and making this possible. And I, I'm gonna ask you right now, for those of you who haven't turned on their cameras yet, it would be nice if you could do that right now, if, um, especially when we get to Ron Davis speech, if you could turn on your camera so he can actually look at faces, like human faces, instead of just a blank screen, um, that'd be really wonderful. And then, um, yeah, I think I'm gonna hand the microphone over to, to the president and um, I'm grateful that you, you're here today to, to welcome our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Professor Beckett. 
uh, for bringing us all together today. Congratulations to, uh, to the Department of uh, English and, and Complet for this initiative. It's very much in keeping with our with our mission uh, on so many different levels. It's a wonderful event. It couldn't be more timely in, in American Black History Month to uh, be doing this as we've had with the uh, uh, Colescott show that I, I see Professor Ginsburg is with us, that um, her initiative of earlier in the month and the uh, Jacob Lawrence show that we've got going. Um, so I echo your thanks to all who have contributed in this initiative and to Professor Jones for joining us also today. And I, I really want to thank and express my profound um, appreciation for the honor that um, you, uh, Ron Davis, are doing us and joining us today. And uh, thank you also, Ms. Hankins, for, for coming to uh, reinforce this uh, message. AUC really has sought to represent um, the best of American values as we preach them and we don't always live them, unfortunately. Um, but foreign audiences uh, appreciate that and that we um, do, whether, whether we wish to or not, we kind of let it all hang out. We are, our many flaws are available to all the world to see. And what really counts is whether we even try to address them in a serious and effective way. The, the, the tragedy of um, slavery and its aftermath in the United States, the, uh, the bigotry and racism that have persisted in our history are something that uh, too often has been just buried and not really examined as, as, it, as it should have been if we are ever to come to terms with these, um, not just the stain and the honor, but the, the poison that has infected American society from, from the outset. Other peoples, I mean, you know, the the, gen the outright genocide of, of the Native Americans. These are all things that Americans are, I think, finally working to come to terms with. I hope under a new administration in the United States, we will um, we will be more effective at that. There's also, as uh, Baltazar, you've just pointed out, there's a a history of the Black American diaspora. Um, around the world, but particularly here in Egypt, that has uh, connected Americans and Egyptians um, over uh, many decades. So, uh, Mr. Davis, you're, you're coming in a in, in a tradition, and you're building it, and you're expanding it. And thank you for choosing AUC as the platform for your deeply moving and important message. I haven't watched the documentary. I, I wanted to watch it together with you earlier. I've, I've come from wall to wall meetings today, but I know the story. And it's as a as a parent, I just find it so profoundly moving. I mean, words words can't express how a, a, a parent deals with the grief of losing a son or daughter at any age, um, but particularly at that that young age on the on the cusp of adulthood. And then even when it's natural causes, it's unbearable pain. But the pain that you and, and your wife have suffered through these unnatural causes, uh, through, as a result of, of hate uh, and deep, deep injustice, it, it is an unspeakable pain. And I admire so much how you have sought to take that loss and pain and convert it into meaningful progress on this cancer uh, the social cancer that cost the life of, of your son and so many others. So please accept my deepest sympathies. And uh, as, as a fellow American, my uh, honoring of you and pride in what you are doing in, in trying to uh, help the rest of us understand what, what we all must do to make sure these, these terrible things don't happen again and to honor the memory of those who have... Uh, lost their lives and suffered just daily indignities um, because of these social ills. What you're doing is very important and meaningful work, and we uh, honor you and we thank you for coming to AUC to do that here with a worldwide audience and our audience here in uh, Egypt. Um, what you are doing is, is truly an international uh, uh, effort of, at the international stage as uh, Professor Beckett has, has noted. And um, I was a former, I was formerly a diplomat. I know the impact of uh, international diplomacy and a world focus on 
a, a global sense of human rights. Each society struggles with these questions in its own way, in its own particular histories. Um, Egypt certainly has its own uh, issues that it pays attention to. Americans are never very effective in helping others advance their own struggles when we simply preach to them. We're best when we live our values and present a positive example. What you have suffered is a dreadful example, but what you are doing about it, um, I think is the best possible example we can offer uh, and, and cling to as Americans as we talk about these issues with, with Egyptians and others on the world stage. Um, it is no accident that it's our uh, Department of uh, English and Comp Lit that is hosting this. We, are, we were founded in, in the humanities here, in the liberal arts, where our premise is that deep and penetrating questions are better, are what we seek and seek to inculcate in our students, not the right answer, not some pat answer that students memorize. And those questions come in the most difficult issues of our times. So you're, you're squarely in the tradition of AUC in our liberal arts tradition. And at the core of that is our uh, department of comp lit, where we look across the literatures, the expressions of different societies and writers at different times and different geographies and religions and cultures. To, uh, to draw out what it means to be human and to deal with these human issues. So the human rights agenda is squarely a part of, of what we teach here and examine and, um, and look at. The United States has been quite a, quite a teaching example over this, this past period in particular, where um, to my deep pain as a former American diplomat, I have to confess that there were leaders of the country and politicians that were were pushing, in my view, uh, racism and bigotry, in which I had always believed was un-American, even if it was part of the American story, it was something Americans all believed was something to be ashamed of and to be fought. And yet we've, we've seen people recently putting these forward as if, you know, building walls between people was an important and good thing to do rather than tearing down the walls. I hope we're back on a more right course and I look forward to hearing what you have to uh, say today about the cause that you are leading, the progress you're making. And once again, I thank you for honoring us and, and letting us be a part of, uh, of your campaign in a humble way. Thank you very much, Ron Davis. Thank you. So, and then um, next, um, thank you very much for these opening remarks. Um, next, we have the outgoing ED of the US Human Rights Network, Lima Hankins, um, sort of give us a, um, a proper introduction of, of Mr. Davis' work and um, how he contributes to human rights struggles in the United States. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I wanna thank um, AUC uh, folks for the invitation and also Ron Davis for being here. Um, as uh, Dr. Beckett mentioned, I am the outgoing executive director of the US Human Rights Network, I'm a human rights attorney, and my organization um, does advocacy around holding the US government accountable for human rights violations that occur in the United States. And we look at ourselves as like continuing that tradition of Malcolm X and others. And we have worked with Mr. Ron Davis for many, many years, and he's a member of our network. Um, it's such a pleasure to be able to um, introduce Ron Davis. Obviously, as you know, he is the father of Jordan Davis, who, as you witnessed in the film, was uh, murdered over loud music by a white vigilante. Um, he is also the CEO of the Jordan Davis Foundation, named after his son. Um, I, too, first met Ron in 2014 at the UN in Geneva, my organization, uh, organized a delegation of Americans to go to the UN to testify um, around uh, uh, human rights violations, a, um, a broad range of hum human rights violations, but one of them was um, looking at human rights violations against uh, Black people within the United States. Um, when uh, Mr. Davis went to uh, give his speech, we had learned about 
as uh, Dr. Beckett said, it was a really heavy time. So we learned about what was happening in Ferguson and Michael Brown had been killed. And so, you know, uh, Mr. Davis actually was about to go on the floor of the UN to give his speech. And he actually wound up changing his speech um, in order to reflect what was happening on the ground at that moment even though he had experienced this immense, unimaginable pain, um, he wanted to make sure that he was being inclusive of other people's experiences, particularly what was happening on the ground. Um, after the killing of George Floyd last summer, my organization and Mr. Davis planned a virtual um, healing event for the families of people who had been killed by racial violence in the UI US, so whether it be vigilante, racist vigilante violence or police violence. And I'll say what struck me is how many of the families, we had the families of Michael Brown, Eric Garner, the Emmett Till family, Oscar Grant, and so many others, how, how many of them actually looked up to Mr. Davis and trusted him and felt supported by him and healed by him. And it was something very beautiful to witness. I've seen um, uh, him lead marches with tens of thousands of people everywhere from, you know, uh, New York to Jacksonville. Um, he's worked with a, a bunch of filmmakers, as he men mentioned before, he may mention that he's actually working on another documentary film. He's done plays, um, all of this uh, with, from everything from, you know, the death penalty to police violence, to vigilant, vigilante violence, really sort of putting a human face to um, human rights issues in the United States and bringing that to the masses. Um, I remember um, him telling a story of seeing families after their loved one had been killed, um, uh, being interviewed by the press and having those microphones in their faces and that look of shock and that look of sort of despair and really understanding it, empath empathizing because he had been there and wanting to create a space um, for those families to be able to process with him, to, to really be able to connect with somebody who understands um, what it's like to have that unique experience. And so he's generally the one who's reaching out to the families after something's happened, pri providing support, going to those places. You know, Mr. Davis is the most inspiring example to me of turning tragedy into purpose. And he has become one of the most outspoken and effective advocates for human rights for Black people and really all people's humanities. So with that, I give you Mr. Ron Davis. Woo, thank you. Thank you so much, Salim. Uh, amazing. Uh, just want to say hello to the students at the American University of Cairo. Thank you for welcoming me. Uh, first, let me thank the president of the university, Francis J. Richardone, Jr. What a mouthful. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank Doris Jones, who will moderate later on today. And I met her a few days ago. Uh, also, I'd like to thank, of course, Salima. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And last but not least, uh, Professor Balthazar Beckett, and who I had to shorten to Professor Czar. So for me, he's Professor Czar. Uh, but I thank you for allowing me to, uh, to be here today to, to represent the Jordan Davis Foundation, to represent, as always, my son Jordan, 17 year old who was killed on the 23rd of November, 2012 which at that point changed my life. Uh, first of all, I wanna say that my life started in Harlem, New York in 1953. So actually in another week, I'll be 68 years old. So I've been on this earth quite a long time. Uh, I've seen a lot, I've traveled a lot, been to over 25 countries and I have a, certain kind of perspective on life around the world. Many of my friends, you know, growing up, their perspective is about their neighborhood, their city, their state, and maybe their country. But my perspective is global. 
So I look at Egypt and I said to myself, I've never been to Egypt and I would love to go. I haven't been to the continent of Africa, but I have been to Asia. So I know you're part of the Middle East, which is part of Asia too. So I kind of got there, but I'll get there. Uh, in Harlem, uh, there was a big civil rights movement raging when I was born. Adam Clayton Powell was the first black or African-American person to be elected to Congress from New York in 1947. And even though it was dangerous at the time, Adam Clayton Powell was talking about racial discrimination back during those times. We're talking the Jim Crow era in the United States. Uh, you have to understand that in that time, August 7th, 1952, a young man who was in prison, in Charlestown prison in Boston, Massachusetts was just coming out of prison. His name was Malcolm Little. And when he got out of prison that day, he changed his name to Malcolm X. Malcolm X in New York and in Boston was an icon. At the time he came out, he had robbery and petty theft and drug usage. And through determination and love for people in general all over the world, he became what we, we idolize and we talk about today. So I let the students know that who you are today may not be who you're gonna be tomorrow. I can, I can definitely say your ideas are gonna change. What you care about is gonna change. What you love, who you love is gonna change. And so continue to read. Literature is so important. Humanities is so important. That's how you grow. You don't grow by hanging out on Facebook, on Instagram, posing for pictures. That's not how you grow. That's how you're entertained. Let your mind grow, travel, learn cultures. This is how we get out of racial discrimination. This is how we get out of colorism, where we have problems in society that many people think that if someone is lighter skinned, that they're a better quality person than someone darker. We have it all over the world. That happens in countries that I travel to, where the colorism exists and the racism exists, even though as some people don't want to admit it. Uh, Salima knows that they call me the unfiltered Ron Davis, so I talk about topics that people may not touch. And it's okay, because I go to my grave happy, because I've spread the good word and I've spread the truth. In Harlem, and after Malcolm came out, uh, a few years later, 1955, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old kid from Chicago, went to Mississippi and he whistled at a woman, a white woman in Mississippi. And he was murdered for whistling at a white woman in Mississippi. He was 14 years old. Not only was he murdered, but he was mangled. He was hung, he was burned, he was beaten and thrown in the river. I've worked many nights with his, his family members, his cousins, his second cousins and his third cousins. I even spoke to one of the family members that was in the bed next to Emmett Till when he was taken from the home in Mississippi. When they came to get Emmett, they thought they had Emmett and they shined a light on the face of Emmett's cousin who I spoke with. And they said, no, that's the wrong nigger, that's not the one. And they told him to go back to sleep. And then they shined a light on Emmett and grabbed him. And I imagine 
the terror that kid, the cousin had at seeing his cousin taken from him and never returned back to the house in Mississippi. I talked to Erica Gordon Taylor. Erica Gordon Taylor was the CEO of the Mamie Till Mobley Foundation, which is Emmett's mother. Mamie Till Mobley, she was one of the catalysts for the civil rights movement in the United States. Because when they brought her son home, Mango, beaten, she wanted the world to see her son. So when Jet Magazine came and took pictures of her son, she opened the casket to let the world know what they had done to her son. Sometimes it takes shock for us to get up off our chairs, to get out on the street and scream and protest. I know recently that we all were talking about Black Lives Matter in the United States. It was a movement. But when we all saw all over the world, George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the video of him losing his life with a knee on his neck, I saw the whole world react. The whole world went into action. That was the first time I've ever in my life seen the whole world, no matter what country, say Black Lives Matter. And they protested by seeing this man on film, on television, lose his life as he called for his mother. As I was growing up in New York, my father, Percy Davis, he listened to Malcolm X speeches. We decided to move in 1960 to Los Angeles, California due to the weather. My brother had asthma and we had to go for a drier climate. While we were in Los Angeles, Malcolm X was doing speeches all over the world. Malcolm came four times at least to Egypt, one of his favorite places. Malcolm's last speech in Egypt was in 1964. He came back to the States and in 1965 in Harlem, New York, Malcolm was murdered in front of his wife who was pregnant with twins and his daughters. In 19, 65, my family decided after the riots in Los Angeles, August 1965, I was 12 years old. There were riots in Los Angeles the same year that Malcolm was murdered. The radio station was saying, burn baby burn. And as the building and all the black neighborhoods were burning down, never could figure out why black people were burning down their own neighborhoods, but they were. It started, the Watts riots started in 1965, no more than 10 blocks from my home in Los Angeles. One of my best friends in my neighborhood, as we were walking, the protesters and the rioters started chasing him right in front of my eyes at the age of 12. He was very light skinned black young man. He was a kid, he was 12 also. They chased him and they tried to beat him and he made it home. And I think at that point, that was the time that I started thinking about colorism. I didn't have a name for it, but I saw that even though this was a black kid, they still chased him home as if he was a white kid because of the color of his skin. The following year, my mother decided to move back to New York after the riots. She just couldn't take it. She had been a World War II veteran. She was in the wax in World War II. She was a nurse. My father was in World War II. He drove the fuel tanks, the fuel trucks up to the tanks in Germany. 
and they've seen enough of the fighting and they've seen enough of the killing. There's over 34 people died in the Watts riot. So when we moved back to New York, we ended up in Queens, New York, a suburb of, of New York. And just so happened that Malcolm X's daughters, most of them grew up in Queens, New York also. I decided that when I went to high school in New York and listening to Martin Luther King, I told you I was old, listening to Martin Luther King uh, in, six, in 67, 68, uh, I, I was torn. I was torn between someone I respected, but he was saying, turn the other cheek. And I had always listened to my father talk about Malcolm and we had him on cassettes. I know a lot of you young people don't know what a cassette is, but it's, it's before the CDs <laughs> and before the streaming, we had cassette players and cassettes. And we used to listen to speeches uh, for Malcolm. And Malcolm didn't say turn the other cheek. Malcolm said the opposite. And I was torn between the two usage of how to attain peace and how to obtain uh, peace of all races. And so I've decided that, you know, you have to decide for yourself. And that's why I say to the students today, you have to decide for yourself what's the method of peace because we can't depend on the politicians anymore. The politicians in our country, they lie, they steal, they go to jail, they have their own particular vices as far as whether they'll vote for something based on money. And so we can't depend on so-called leaders in our country. But you always have a heart and you always should know what to do, what's right to do. And if you're a student at the university, I'm sure you've had a lot of challenges in this area. Who to listen to? What professors to listen to? Listening to your parents and your, and your, and your mother and your fathers. And at some point in your life, you're gonna to have to make a decision for yourself. I made a decision for myself that I was gonna have input from all countries and all cultures. My friends was very diverse as I grew up, but I never knew that I would grow up to sustain a tragedy, which I have today. I met Jordan's mother, Lucy, when I was working for Delta Airlines. I started working for Delta in 1973. I was traveling the world at that time, went to many countries. And in 1988, I was on a flight and Jordan's mother, Lucy, Congresswoman Lucy McBath was a flight attendant. And we started gazing at each other and we started smiling at each other on the plane. And as they say, everything else is history. As we tried to have a child, Lucy became pregnant and she had a miscarriage. She became pregnant again and had another miscarriage. We were very distraught as many parents that have had suffered this are distraught. So then she was pregnant for a third time and we were happy. We were so happy, we even named the baby Lucian. And then all of a sudden in the fifth month, we had a fetal demise. The doctors told her that Lucian was dead inside her, but she had to keep Lucian for another month or so before they could take Lucian out. So we suffered through that. And of course we cried and we prayed 
and the doctors told us that Lucy could not hold uh, a baby for nine months and told us she could never have a baby, could never have a child. I had already had a son with a prior marriage and I felt so bad to have this lovely wife that couldn't have a child. And we met uh, a specialist and this doctor said that there was a procedure that they could turn the uterine wall. And if they turn the uterine wall, there's a chance that the fetus would attach itself to the opposite wall, which was stronger than the wall that all the other babies were trying to attach to. So we tried the procedure and the procedure worked. Lucy was pregnant. She was on the bed rest the whole time. And she held Jordan for nine months and she had a C-section and out came Jordan. And we felt that that was our miracle baby because we wasn't supposed to have Jordan. And I was the first one to kiss Jordan when he first came into the world. And we named him Jordan because we've heard so much in the Bible and in history about the Jordan River. Some people just call it the Jordan. And I remember there was a scripture about Matthew uh, 3, Matthew 3 and 13. And on that it said, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized and to baptize by him. The Jordan is also referred to as a source of fertility. So Jordan is named after the Jordan River. I founded the Jordan Davis Foundation in 2013, a few months after Jordan was killed. The website there is walkwithjordan.org. I repeat, it's walkwithjordan.org. Uh, when Jordan was killed, it was picked up by the news stations all over the world and their affiliates. People, uh, I think the journalists were so outraged that a 46 year old white man would shoot into a car full of kids and kill a child and try to kill all three, all the other three children in the car over loud music. That's what it came to. And the outrage sparked the national news report from all the stations in America and it spread to stations around the world. We were getting messages from as far away as Iceland and Finland as far away as Fiji, as Australia was sending messages of condolences to me and Lucy. At the time, me and Lucy were divorced at the time. We were co-parenting Jordan. Jordan lived out of both households and he had two families. And when Jordan was shot and killed, my whole world changed. No parent ever wants to get that phone call, that dreaded phone call. I remember that Salima talked about how I was sitting on that couch when I got the phone call. I was at work, I came home and sitting on that couch, I just remember it with the news putting microphones in front of me, my eyes are just rolling around in my head. And you just don't believe that this is happening to you. And so I know how all the parents that lose their loved ones, that lose their children, how they feel. And I remember Trayvon Martin had just died that same year. And I remember his parents sitting on the couch doing the same thing. And his father called me, left a message and said, I'd like to welcome you to a club that nobody wants to be a member. And since then, I have welcomed so many mothers and fathers to this same club in the last eight years. 
unbelievable. And I've heard their cries and how they want justice for their kids. And so as I rushed to the hospital, not knowing whether my son was alive or dead, it took an hour for them to come out and to even talk to me. And they said they had a young man there that apparently had dropped his wallet and we're not sure if it was your son or not. So I gave them a photo of my son. And I was sitting there waiting for them to come back to tell me. And I was there with a six foot five, 265 pound policeman who was at the door inside, making sure no one else came in. And he was just talking to me and he was saying that he hoped everything was gonna turn out all right. He was very empathetic. So when the door opened and the doctor came in, he was followed by this black lady and she was a chaplain and also another policeman came in. And all I remembered was, they said to me, I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, but we could not resuscitate. And he said some more words and I have no idea what he said to this day. On my life, I cannot remember what else he said. And I remembered that I must have let out such a scream, such an emotional scream that came from the bottom of my stomach, the bottom of my heart, the depths of my soul, that when I turned and looked at the six foot five policeman, he was in tears. The chaplain was in tears. They were pulling tissue out, wiping their eyes, and they were crying. And the only one talking was the doctor. And I, hear, and I could hear nothing. I could just see tears flowing. And I asked to see my son and they said it was an investigation. And they wasn't sure if I could see him. I said, lead me to him now. And I started walking toward the door and I saw my son and they had a sheet pulled up to his neck. There was a little spot of blood on his, on his nose. And I remember his left eye was a little bit open. And for some reason, I felt that he could see his daddy. I walked over to him and the policeman said, there's a murder investigation, so you can't touch him. And I ignored him and I hugged my son. I hugged my son. And they didn't stop me. And I said to Jordan, I said, Dad's here, dad is here. And I said, I kissed you when you were born, when you first came into this world. I was the first one to kiss you. And now son, I'm gonna be the last one to kiss you. And I said, we named you Jordan for the river Jordan you crossed over to us and they said it would be a miracle for you to be here. And I thank God for giving me 17 years with you. And I said, you'll be crossing over the river Jordan again. And God is now gonna take care of you. And I kissed them goodbye. Let me tell you about my son, Jordan. Jordan was a joy. Out of all the things I did, I traveled prior to Jordan to different places all over the world. The greatest joy I had was having Jordan. I joined the Human Rights Network. Uh, we went to Gallup, New Mexico. We were advocating for the indigenous people. Some people call them the Native Americans, but I call them the indigenous people of America. We advocated because the US government had fracking in the mines, had radioactive material, and their well water was poisoned. 
and we advocated for them. Then with the US Human Rights Network, we went to Tucson, Arizona, where they were bringing in people that were coming here for asylum. And we spoke on their behalf to the judges in the courtrooms in Tucson, Arizona. Then with the US Human Rights Network, we went over to Nogales, Mexico, to the refugee camps to help people from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico trying to get into the United States because they're being shot and killed in their country. We're trying to help them come in and save their families. When I got back home, within a week I got called by the US Human Rights Network that we are wanted in Geneva, Switzerland, that we needed to go to speak about racial discrimination in the United States for people of color. I repacked my bags and in August, 2014, I went to Geneva, Switzerland with a contingent, Trayvon Martin, Sabrina Fulton, her mother was there with me. Salima Hankins was there with me. And that's why I met the czar. Czar was there with me, Professor Czar. And we talked to several people in Switzerland. But as I was preparing my speech, the United Nations Conference, as Salima said, I changed my speech because I found out about Ferguson, where there was rampant racial discrimination in Ferguson, Missouri, where they had killed Michael Brown Jr. in the streets for not listening to a policeman who told him to stop walking in the street. Shot him about 14 times, actually blew this teenager's brains out in the middle of the street with his mother and father coming. They roped off the area and told him not to come to the rescue of their son who was laying there bleeding in the streets. It took them over an hour to put a blanket over this child laying in the hot sun in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. When the paramedics came, the police waved the paramedics away. They wouldn't even let and pick them pick up the body and take him to the hospital or take him to the mortuary. That young man, a teenager, laid in the streets for four and a half hours in America with his parents and his friends and his family looking on. And of course, there were riots to follow in Ferguson. So I spoke about that at the United Nations conference and everyone were outraged at the conference. When I got back, I was asked to come to Ferguson, Missouri, which I did, and I met with the mother and father of Michael Brown. And I helped them bury their son. I went to the funeral and I also went to the graveside. Many of these things that I had to do, I took home with me. It stayed in my gut. When I was there, I was advocating for these families. I had to be strong, I had to talk, I had to make speeches, but they all played a part of who I am and what I am today. And I continue to work with these families, the family of Oscar Grant out in Oakland, California, who was killed in 2009 on New Year's Day at the Bart's train station in Oakland, California. They made a film called Fruit Bell Station, if you want to take a look at what happened to him. Many of these families I work with, Eric Garner in Staten Island, who just told the police, I cannot breathe, I can't breathe, several times, I can't breathe. Something that we all take for granted. We think in this world we should be able to breathe. But 
that some of us really just cannot breathe with so many things that are happening in this world today. So as I, uh, I got back and I said, through the foundation, my main goal would be working with these families, not only in the United States by giving scholarships to the seniors in high school going to college through my foundation, but also having events in different cities in the United States that we put on that we don't charge a penny for none of these disadvantaged youth to come to our events and to celebrate, to have music events with us as a give back to them. I also go abroad. I spent a lot of time in the Philippines. With just one year before the pandemic, we fed over 350 families in a village called Hifkos in Hilo Hilo in one of the provinces in the Philippines. The year before that, we fed 150 families in another province. These people that are making four and five dollars a day feeding a family of four. We go there with doctors without borders. We go there with nurses that I bring with me where we can feed and also give medical services. And also we pay for medicines. We go to the pharmacies and we pay for medicines for these people that have no one to advocate for them. And so I find myself that I heal by giving to others, by taking on this burden that there's only one way for me to heal and that's to give of services. Lastly, that's been very significant to me. For many years after Jordan was killed, as the news were interviewing me and Lucy, his mother, they had always asked us, do we forgive Michael Dunn who murdered our child? And I would always say no. And Lucy would always say yes. Lucy's very religious and she says that because she has God in her heart, she has to forgive him. As I said before, I'm unfiltered. And in my heart, if I don't forgive him, I'm not gonna say just for the camera, just for the news that I forgive. And I said, no, each time I didn't forgive. And so I find myself in situations where I don't know how they occur, but I was contacted by one of the nonprofits in India. And the nonprofit said the government of India would like to celebrate the 69th anniversary of the death and the martyrdom of Mahatma Gandhi. And they're bringing people from all over the United States, different walks of life. And we've seen you on television, on CNN, and some of the other shows. And we want to bring you over, Mr. Davis. And so they brought me to New Delhi, India. And they had a celebration for Gandhi. And for me to step right at the same place that Gandhi was shot and killed, where his blood actually spilled on the ground, I stood there. There's a small monument to where he was shot and killed. So I know this is the place. And the vice president of India and some other dignitaries were there. And we had the celebration of his life. And I remembered the sacrifices he made for his country at the time when it was under British rule. And then they took me to the Taj Mahal and I saw one of the seven wonders of the world and saw this building that the love of this, of this man that controlled and ruled the country had for his third wife where he would build a monument that would stand the test of time. And I thought about what love to have. And I felt like I have that same love for Jordan, that love that I could just want to build a legacy for my son. And then they took me to the Himalayan mountains. And as I was up in the Himalayas, and, we, and we're speaking about the end of January where it was cold in the Himalayas, we were up there for five days and four nights. 
a thin mattress about this thick. No hot running water as we stayed in the ashram. No radio, no television, no internet. Howler monkeys jumping up and down from the trees across the roofs. People walking with these monkeys. A pure vegetarian diet. Breathing exercises at six in the morning as a group. Yoga exercises at seven in the morning, every day for five days. And then we met the Swami of the ashram who controlled the whole ashram. He had been to the United States, he had heard about Jordan. And when he had all the monks around and all the other different groups were around together, we were sitting there listening to the Swami, we call him Swami G, he has a long name. And he looked into my eyes with a look that would just pierce your soul. And he said, what do you need from me, Ron? And I was shocked that he even knew my name. And I just was searching my, my soul. My, my heart skipped a beat. And I didn't know what to say. And for some reason out of my soul came the word forgiveness. How to forgive. I said, the man that murdered my son, I cannot forgive. And he said, Michael Dunn is in prison. And you're also in prison, but you have the key. I'm not asking you, Ron, to forgive the act that the man did by killing your son. But what you have to do is separate the act from the man that God created. When God created an innocent baby, Michael Dunn, and created the man Michael Dunn before the act, that's who you have to forgive. And because he separated that for me and let me know by forgiving the man that God created, would not forgive the act that he did by murdering my son, I was able to take that key and get out that prison and to forgive Michael Dunn, the man. And it was light to my soul. My heart was no longer heavy. My soul was no longer heavy. Until this day, I could speak about it. I could cry about it. As I go to universities across the country, I talk about it. And so I learned so much from this man in this ashram, way up in the Himalayas. It took me all the way to go there halfway around the world to learn forgiveness. And I know Jordan was with me. And before I left India, I had a film session and also a talk for this convention that they held for the women of India that had been molested, raped, that had been assaulted in India, which I didn't realize had a very high rate of assault to women. And that these women are afraid to even go out of their house at nine o'clock at night unless they're with a man. And these women that had been assaulted and raped, they asked me to come and show my film and to, and to speak. And at the end of my speech, they presented me with a handmade shawl that was made by the women that had been assaulted and abused and raped. And this is a shawl that I wear today. When Jordan was killed, I noticed something. He had worn a cross around his neck for many years to the night he was shot and killed he did not have his cross on. So when I came home, I looked for it and I found it. And ever since that day that Jordan was killed, I've been wearing his cross every single day. And I wear it today as I do every day for the last eight years that he's been killed. 
Enough about me. I'm going to talk some about Jordan. I know I'm long-winded, but I don't get this opportunity to talk to the people in Egypt. And I just want to say that Jordan, he liked to play basketball with his friends. He wasn't a very good basketball player, but he always liked to play. He was almost six feet tall at the age of 16 and 17. And he never gave up, even though he couldn't play that well. He was a great swimmer. We put him in swim classes when he was young. And we used to go to the beach in Jacksonville Beach. And that was one of our favorite places. And we used to turn our backs to the waves and see who's going to get knocked down first. And uh, sometimes I would just fall down just to hear Jordan laugh at me, just to hear his laughter. Uh, Jordan was an honest kid. He loved kids of all nationalities, all of his friends with well, different races. Jordan's gonna miss his friends. I know he's still here looking over his friends. Um, we miss Jordan, all of us around here. We miss Jordan, we love Jordan. I just wanna make sure that I don't miss anything, but just wanna let you know one of Jordan's favorite TV shows was 24 with uh, the TV series. And uh, we used to sit there and watch 24 all the time and I miss him. And I decided to get the series 24 with Kiefer Sutherland just so I can reminisce about sitting with Jordan on my chair. And I just wanna let you know that I'm gonna continue to fight for him. I'm going to continue to give to the families. I'm going to continue to support his legacy. And I ask you to support his legacy by going to walkwithjordan.org. And I ask you to make an effort to make sure that racial discrimination in your country doesn't prosper. Make sure that colorism in your country doesn't prosper. I thank you for listening to me today. And God bless. I'd like to now turn it over to Doris Jones. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you so very much for sharing such a heart wrenching story. As you know, when we met on Tuesday, um, I had an opportunity to not only listen at length to your story and to your, about your son's wonderful story. Um, I must say um, with what you shared today and I want to echo, I gather I can begin by echoing a critical point raised by President Michiodoni that your presence here serves multiple purposes. One of which is that you are placing a face on human rights. And in this particular instance, you're placing a face on international human rights. Our president also stated, and I had great appreciation for this comment as well as he welcomed you. And that is that your presence further represents one of the hallmarks of what a liberal arts education is. And that is liberal arts, the humanities, we are in a position to ask the deep and probing questions. And one of the questions that certainly you have presented in your lovely talk, and that is what is human rights? And what you've managed to do rather critically is that you charted a, a history, if you will, that you took us back to your childhood, to where you were born, and that you spoke about Emmett Till and his tragedy and being taken from the home of his cousin in the middle of the night and to suffer the tragedy that he did. And I can recall two winters ago that my youngest daughter and I visited the African American Museum in Washington DC where the very casket in which he was buried, his mother actually wanted it to be on display in uh, this museum. 
And then you reference, of course, this overwhelming significance of Malcolm X. And I would also venture to say that when you mention that following the tragic death of your son, that you were contacted by all of the national media houses throughout the United States, but international media houses as well. And that at a certain point, all of the cameras, the journalists, they disappear. And this is the nature of hard news, as we know, that the very nature of hard news is to report tragedies, natural disasters and the like. And then eventually that cycle moves away. But it's venues like this. It is the American University in Cairo through the auspices of uh, the Department of English and Comparative Literature that can open a space for you to talk about your experience so that as you have said so beautifully that the legacy and memory of Jordan will live on, that we can celebrate along with you the memory of Jordan and that we can have a discussion about why it continues to be and remains such a struggle to sustain human rights, international human rights, and that as a result of this tragedy, this social ill, as President Richie Adoni also referred to, that this social ill, these social cancers, your son tragically was a victim of it. But you have managed to, out of this tragedy, and I shared this with you on Tuesday when we talked at length, that out of this tragedy, there has emerged a beauty. There is a sense of beauty here that you did find, as you said a few moments ago, having traveled halfway around the world to the Himalayas to meet with someone who would allow you to separate that anger and the anxiety and the trauma of losing a child that, as you said, that you and your wife, Lucy, would often say that Jordan was your miracle baby, only to find that to lose him to a social cancer. So I want to thank you for bringing us into this discussion. I want to thank you for sharing this story. And as I also shared with you, that it takes a considerable amount of, of courage uh, to tell the, this narrative, to share this narrative with various audiences, international audiences for that matter. So we are so very grateful to you for giving us a sense that our shared humanity is one in which it's not limited to one geographic location, that it is international in nature. And that again, that through the tragic loss of your son, we are here today discussing international human rights at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. So I want to thank you. And let's begin now by taking some questions from our audience. Okay. All right. Okay, do, let's take some questions. Hello. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself. Sure. Um, I, first of all, before I introduce myself, I'd really, really like to thank you, Mr. Davis, for coming here today. Uh, my name is Nina Lee, and I'm here at the AUC studying, but I'm actually originally from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh -huh. So it feels, yeah, it feels almost serendipitous that we meet. Um, I feel very emotional. I felt very emotional um, watching the documentary and listening to you speak because I really remember um, when when all of when when this happened. And actually, I the gas station was on Southside Boulevard. I used to live on Bay Meadows, right down the street. Um, so I remember when it happened, and I remember how angry. I like people like I felt and how people felt and it, it really brought back a lot of memories. Um, I feel kind of overwhelmed actually. 
right now talking all about this, but uh, I just really like to thank you for being here and for sharing your unfiltered emotions with us. I think the compassion and empathy are very underrated, but that they're really what we need to talk about, to open these conversations and to open our hearts to other people and to other struggles, as you said before, opening your heart to women in India who had been assaulted, opening your heart to refugees halfway across from where you live. Um, it, it's, I, I, I just wanted to share uh, one part of my memory, not necessarily pose a question, but I remember when, when this happened, that people were in Jacksonville were sort of characterizing it as the whole loud music situation, like it, it was a loud music thing. And I remember that one of the major outcomes or the one of the major outcomes of this was not revoking Stand Your Ground, was not um, combating really upfrontly racial discrimination, racism, prejudice. It was the direct outcome uh, I remember from City Hall was to make a law to not allow people to play loud music unless their windows were open. So uh, I remember the outrage of this and, and all my own confusion really about this whole scenario and how come that after someone had just died who was really close to my own age at the time, uh, how come the only thing that they did was to change a law about how loud can music be played in your car? So I don't really have a question posed, but I, I really just wanted to thank you for being here and say it, it's, it's wonderful to, to meet you and to thank hear you, your story. Thank you, Nina. It's wonderful to meet you also. And if you come back to Jacksonville, please make sure you get in touch with me because I would love to meet you in person. But you, you, make a, you, you make a very great point about that. You stand your ground. Uh, we've been fighting that in the United States for a long time. And for those that are in Egypt that don't know about stand your ground, the, the basic part of it is that if uh, you feel that your life is in danger, uh, you can actually pull out your gun or have a weapon and take action and kill someone and claim stand your ground that you felt your life was in danger. And even though it may work out that the person were, was not threatening you, you can still get away with murder, basically. You know, uh, as long as you can prove that you really thought that someone was going to harm you you know, have bodily harm. And so, you know, a lot of times you're walking down the street and you might look at somebody and you think they look dangerous. How many times have we done that? How many times have we gone in a neighborhood that was, as they say, sketchy and you saw maybe two or three guys uh, uh, just staying on the corner and they look kind of, you know, maybe look like they might want to do something to you. And so you walked on the other side of the street because it kind of made you fearful. Well, if that person walked up to you and you were feel fearful of them, you can't take your gun out and shoot them just because you were in fear of your life. You know, you, you have to have a reason and have a reasonable fear of your life. And so that's how Michael Dunn was convicted. It was because it wasn't reasonable for him to fear these children. He tried to make up a story that they had a gun and that was proved that it was just a lie that they didn't have a weapon. And them just talking back to him, that doesn't give him the right to shoot and kill kids because they talk back to him. And so re reasonable fear is what we're fighting here in the United States, again, on stand your ground because what's reasonable to you may not be reasonable to someone else. And so that's still an issue here in the United States. And, uh, we're still fighting that issue of staying your ground. Okay. Nina, I also want to thank you for that wonderful um, comment, those comments, I should say, 
And I do hope that perhaps you and Mr. Davis can connect when you return to Jacksonville. Yeah. What a lovely connection there. Right. Okay, let's take another question. I'm sure there uh, are. Yes, please. Yes. Um, uh, of course, uh, yeah, I just would like to start by thanking Mr. John Davis for uh, sharing his um, uh, sincere feelings and emotions that uh, all of us we are touched uh, by. Um, and I just would, I don't have a question. Yeah, I just would like to share some ideas with you um, in relation to this idea which he, which he raised. Um, by, the, by the way, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, present myself. My name is Nadwa Nadwa Dawood. I am a, a PhD, PhD student in Cairo University. Uh, actually, I am interested in um, uh, post-colonial studies and cultural studies and memory studies. And this idea of uh, forgiving, um, of course, we know this idea of forget and forgive, um, something that happens. Um, an injustice that have uh, that has occurred to you, um, and this idea of uh, uh, this comparison between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King uh, in relation to the Palestinian issue, uh, do you think that with this continuous misery and oppression that the Palestinians are suffering uh, since the beginning of the 20th century up till now, um, can we think about this idea of uh, forgetting and forgiving? Actually, I'm asking a question. I, I said that I'm not going to ask a question. Uh, and why I'm saying this because um, and I, I just would like to say that uh, with the Palestinian issue, we have this idea of a continuous, endless misery that, that is misrepresented all over the world. All the people feel that when Palestinians uh, voice and speak their suffering, no, they are terrorists, they are anti Semites, uh, they are. Uh, they shouldn't say this, um, but this is not fair. This is not human. Um, so I just would, would like to, to share this idea with you. Thank you so much. I'm, Thank I'm you, one Nathan. of those people that, <clears throat> I look at human biology. I think mean, that's just my personal view of the world. 99.9% .9 of our DNA is exactly the same. So in the words of Albert Einstein, racism is really a social construct. You know, we're all the same. Your, your religious views is one thing. Your, your culture is something else. But as human beings, for me, we're all the same as far as human beings are concerned. And so uh, I don't believe in discrimination at all with anyone. I don't care what your religious views are. I don't care what your culture is. I don't care what your skin color is. That's my personal opinion that I don't believe in any racial discrimination. And what, no matter whether it's religious based or anything, I don't believe in discrimination at all. And that's my view to the world. And I'll continue to say my view. I don't believe people should discriminate against anybody. You know, you meet a person, I meet you, whether you're Palestinian, doesn't matter, that's your religion, whatever. I have to judge you by the character of your heart and who you are to me. And I wish all the students that are listening to my voice would understand that about when they take issue and when they stand for certain things and they stand against certain people because of their religions. I want you to take a step back and realize that we are all put on this earth by the same creator. And that each individual that you come to judge them for what they do in your presence. Judge them by their character. Don't judge them by hearsay, but when you hear the news say this is that type of person. No, judge them for yourself. And if you can't judge them for yourself, then don't judge them at all. Yes. That's my view. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, yeah, what I'd like to say, um, when I'm talking about the Palestinian issue, it's not a religious issue, it's uh, something related to humanity, that uh, all the world watch and see this uh, kind of, uh, um, let's say, misery that the Palestinians uh, live, uh, in, this is their daily life, and still we cannot say or they, um, and 
mean, the majority of the people or the world believe that uh, they shouldn't say uh, um, uh, this is not fair. Uh, this is this is a complete injustice to the to the people, uh, and I'm not saying this is because they are not they, they are Muslims or whatever, or the Israelis are Jews. I'm saying that this is not fair for some people to suffer such misery, uh, 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 and even they are not able to present themselves in a good way to the world. And um, a big percentage from the world, they 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 believe that when we come to, to talk about Palestine, this is something which is a taboo, something which we shouldn't talk about. Uh, um, and uh, they, they are misrepresented in a specific way uh, so that they cannot voice their uh, suffering and their misery. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm adding the, 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 the Palestinian uh, lives and I'm saying that uh, Palestinian lives also matter. Uh, they, they are uh, important. And if we consider the misery that they are suffering from, we will say and we will believe that this is not fair, this is not human. And um, as, as Martin Luther King uh, in his famous speech, uh, I have a dream. I have a dream for the Palestinians that they could be here one day and they could one day have a voice in the world and have a platform, uh, have a, um, let's say, a kind of justice um, to their uh, cause uh, one day. Well, I, I work with a, a big advocate of the Palestinian people in New York City. I've worked with her, and I don't know if you know her, but she's very famous in the United States, Linda Sassor. Linda Sassor has been on news shows all over the United States and all over the world, and I've worked with her. So I, you are being heard. You may not think you're being heard, but you're being heard in the United States also. So I thank you for your comments, and you know, and I thank you that you're being heard on this on this platform anyway. And so there's many people hearing you today, and I am so glad that you had a chance to speak your mind and to speak your your truth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nagwa. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to someone else. I know we have others in our audience who would like to either ask a question or make a comment as well. Um, Dr. Ahdef Suif has her um, hand raised. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? No? We can yes. hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, right. Well, first of all, Mr. Davis, I mean, obviously, what, what can one say um, after such a presentation and not just the presentation of course but everything that has led to it um, I, I mean it is as as has um, as the president has said this is like every every parent's nightmare and I think even without being a parent it's just um, well I mean, all, all my sympathy and um, and really a great deal of respect and honor for what you have managed and are managing to do with it um, for the parents, for the families and for the public good. And I think something to take very much to heart is what you said about how one finds comfort in doing something for other people. So I think you have given us a great deal to think about. I think you give the world a great deal to think about and a great deal to learn from. Um, and thank you for that. And uh, to welcome you virtually to Egypt. And this is the second time I hear you say that you would like to come to Egypt in person one day. Let's hope it would be very, very soon after COVID um, ends and that it will be possible to welcome you here in person. I have just two little comments. I mean, there's nothing that can be asked really. I mean, you, you just um, cover an entire world and and mode of feeling in your in your talk um but i understand why nedra would would pick up on the palestinian thing because when you were describing the young man 
who was left uh, to die on the pavement while the police prevented his parents and his parents and friends were behind the barrier and were being prevented from reaching him. And while the paramedics were being sent away, then of course, for me, as for many other people, that image gets translated to Palestine, which is somewhere where that is happening all the time. And in fact, I think that was one of the big moments when we saw banners go up from Palestine, from Gaza, saying Gaza supports Ferguson. This was maybe this moment, maybe another, but there was very much a feeling of, uh, of identification and of solidarity there. And then maybe on a slightly trivial note, I would just ask you, when you're watching your favorite show, 24, which used to be my favorite show, until I started um, sniffing a certain Islamophobia there with the sort of picking bomb idea and so on. So maybe maybe you'll watch out for that as well. Um, but other than that, uh, you you know, it's such a wonderful picture of Ron, which is uh, of, of John, which is I guess the, a big big. Um, motivation behind all this. I've already opened um, Walk with Jordan on the on, on my laptop, and I certainly will take a walk with Jordan. And um, you're you know you're continuing to care for your boy and and look after him, which is all any any of us would ever hope to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, they proclaim every year in Jacksonville, Florida, Jordan Davis Day on his birthday, February sixteenth. And, uh, and, you know, I, I noticed when you said that, um, you know, even though you don't have children, you know. Oh, I do, I do, I have children. Oh, you do, okay. I have well, children, I have a grandchild now, absolutely. Okay, okay, well, people that don't have children, uh, you know, this, uh, these tragedies, I wanna just take this time to say, and, and I'll be brief, because I know I'm long-winded at times, but uh, these tragedies, they not only, kill the individual, but it changes the lives of family members throughout. For instance, you know, I know Czar is a very avid reader of Malcolm X. And Malcolm X's daughters, who I've met his eldest daughter, who was there at the Audubon Ballroom when her father was killed, uh, Atala Shabazz, which she is the ambassador at large for Belize. And I've met her several times and we've had talks about her father. And I noticed one thing about Malcolm X's daughters. He has six daughters, but he had only one grandchild out of six daughters. And that's very odd when you think about it, is that the, the, the whole murder of his family, of, his, of, of him, how it, it affected his family, how it affected his daughters. His daughters all went to great schools, Princeton and so on and so forth, but, and they're all well-educated, but they haven't been able to seem to have children or have a family. And there's something about the murder of your father being a public image, you know, that I say has an effect on them because why wouldn't six daughters have children? Only one had a child and, and it was tragic because the one that had the child, uh, the child ended up being the one that was murdered in Mexico at the age of 28, was beat up and killed in a bar in Mexico. And he was named Malcolm Shabazz. And a lot of people don't know that. He was the only grandchild of Malcolm X. He was named after Malcolm. And so the tragedy persisted and, and his mother, she actually put a hit out on Louis Farrakhan, who is the leader of the Nation of Islam, she actually put a hit out trying to kill him for killing her father, for, for being the one that spread the word to kill her father. And she was arrested and she had to go undergo psychiatric treatment. So these families go through a, a lot of, of really anguish. And so when I talk to the oldest daughter, I can just tell that she is very, very uneasy about talking to people about her father, about letting people into her personal life, whether she's married or not, nobody knows, you know, those kind of things. And so, you know, most of her uh, daughters, if you kind of look up their uh, personal things, you don't see many 
uh, references to their personal life, whether they're married or not. You don't see any children. If you look up Wikipedia and all this, because it, it was such a great harm to them psychologically that it's hard to recover from that. And so I thank God that I found something like my foundation to keep me from going down that path. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for that, Mr. Davis. If I might just, I want to add um, to your comments about families, uh, the impact that such tragedies have upon families. Again, when we met on Tuesday, we talked a bit more about this and that um, you referenced uh, that the tragedy can either go one of two ways, that there are instances in which the family may be able to remain committed um, to the cause. In your instance, you have this foundation, which is taking you around the world. And I actually refer to what you're doing now, that given the, the death, the murder of your son, that there is this tragic beauty, if you will, that you're, again, not only to keep his legacy alive, but you're also able to connect with people globally to tell his story and to help families and to help children and to instill a sense of humanity, if you will. And this is once again, um, a critical part of our shared humanity. And it's one of the core reasons why you're here with us today. I think we do have another question. Um, before, the, before the question, I wanna put you on the spot, Doris Jones. Okay. Because I think there's something that the students need to hear and need to see. When I spoke to you the other day, and I spoke to you a little bit about my tragedy. As a, as a professor in, in, in this university, people, the students may have an opinion about you. Uh, uh, someone, of course, that's well-educated and of course uh, goes down the line by the book and this, that, and the other. They may have that opinion, I'm not sure. But one thing that I don't know if they've ever seen about you that I saw was that when I told you my story, in my tragedy, you had to go off camera because you cried as I was telling you the story. You weep and had to go off camera and get tissue. And I wanna know what was your feeling at that moment? What hit you about my story that made you cry? Hmm. I think well, it's there important. Was, there were so, I think my, again, my humanity, my, my, my profound sense of humanity and that I too am a parent. I'm also a grandparent. And it's unconscionable to even begin to think about how it would feel to lose a child. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely unconscionable. Mm -hmm. And to hear you once again share such a riveting, profoundly tragic story touch the core of my soul that I'm immediately thinking about my own children and their sense of, of safety, navigating spaces, um, feeling a, a constant sense of, of being safe. And, and I, I, can, I can reflect back to when my children were teenagers and when my, my oldest daughter got her driver's license and I can distinctly remember the feeling that when she drove off for the first time, taking her solo drive from our suburban neighborhood, that I, I cheered on, of course, that she's gaining the sense of independence. But unfortunately, I'm also thinking about her overall safety, not only as a driver joining hundreds of thousands of drivers on the road, but as a young African-American woman, um, and the possibilities of encountering um, any number of, of circumstances. So again, to answer your question more succinctly, I was moved to tears by your story because not only are we human, it is our humanity that connects us all. This is something you beautifully said from the beginning of your talk. This is why your son's murder is taking you around the world, that what you're finding and all of the countries that you visit is that we are all the same and all that we're all experiencing this life, that 
we are we are all trying to make connections with each other and and to and to ask this perennial question why do we remain so disconnected that we are continuing in this space of tragedy where your son's life could be taken in just a second because he was playing music so loudly and again as to acknowledge what our what President Richie Adoni stated that this is a profound social ill that disallows the human being to recognize the significance and the preciousness of another human humans. Thank life. you for that. Thank you. That's what I needed. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, you're most welcome. Yes. Okay. I I think. Um, Let's see, we're looking at the time here. Maybe we can take one more question. And I see that our colleague is here on the screen, Dr. Hawkins. I see that you are, are visibly here. Hello. <laughs> the last time we were together, we were enjoying Hello. ourselves here in Cairo. <laughs> oh, time and yes yes say about the AUC campus certainly before yes. COVID 19 reared its ugly head so yes it's, it's wonderful to see you again thank you and so good to see you too absolutely I'm going to yield to you because I'm sure that you would like to <laughs> comment yes and I and I've taken over from my daughter my daughter Salima invited me uh, a few years ago uh, to the U.S. Human Rights Network conference in Austin. And you were there, uh, Mr. Davis, and I got a chance to meet you and see this film. And it was just an amazing experience. And we took pictures. Yeah. And, I, and, and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, I could not do this. I could not do this. I have <laughs> boys and girls. I have children. And I don't think, I think I would have fallen apart. So that's one of the things. And I think it's important the the, the students to understand that it is the moving around the world and talking to audience that, that gives you some resiliency. But also you have to develop your own self care. And that I think it's important for students to understand that sometimes when you're alone, when you're by yourself, what do you do to get that self-care that you need in order to keep going on? Because no one is there with you when you are alone. Right. I am very fortunate that we're in the age of video and in the age of Google. <laughs> and, and sometimes, you know, if I'm all alone in the middle of the night at one o'clock in the morning, guess what? It's um, two o'clock in the afternoon in the Philippines. <laughs> so sometimes what I do is I'll video chat with some of the kids or some of my coordinators that coordinate my missions in the Philippines. And this, as, as a matter of fact, this past um, Valentine's Day, I just said, you know what? There's a lot of school kids that parents, again, are only making four or $5 a day to feed the whole family. And I said, they can't afford candy for Valentine's Day or anything like that, you know? So I decided to buy all the school kids and all the kids, even the ones that didn't go to school, Valentine's candy for the whole village. Mm -hmm. So I bought bags and bags of candy. I had my coordinator go to the store, videotape, you know, video chat while she was going to the store. I said, buy that and buy that. And so I could actually buy it in the store with her showing me on the video chat. And then she videotaped her delivering the candy to the kids on Valentine's Day. So that is what gets me to the mood I need to be in when I'm sad, because I have tears almost every night for Jordan. But, you know, that made me smile and the kids are so happy to get Valentine's candy. So things like, gestures like that. That's how I give it, you yeah. know. Lovely, lovely. Yeah. Dr. Hawkins, do you did you want do you want to make um, another comment? 
looks so much like your daughter. I mean, she looks so much <laughs> like you. I cannot believe how, how much she looks like you. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, well, I hope I look more like her because she's younger <laughs> than she looks like me. But I also wanted to say to you, when we talk about Malcolm X, I mean, we're, especially now we're finding out that that the FBI, there was a deathbed confession of this individual who had infiltrated the, uh, uh, the uh, nation and and uh, Malcolm's guards, and he's talking about the fact that the FBI and the New York Police Department had some involvement in in Malcolm's death. And I think what you when you were talking about the whole idea of the family, the legacy of these murders on the family especially for those people who were Muslim, uh, Malcolm's family, they are living with knowing that all of these things that happened to him were not just the nation. Right. They were involved. There, there's a larger um, conspiracy around that. So that is, that is something that they have had to live with all of their lives. And so I think that also has uh, an impact on how they have been able to move in the world. And uh, um, I, I do think that, that, and I also wanted to say <laughs> that it's just a really, I, I, like I said, I can't imagine how people who have suffered these kinds of life changing tragedies continue to move on. So I really wanted to thank you so much for your presentation and being yeah, here. Yeah, and, th and they knew ahead of this film that's out on Netflix that um, the government, as I talked to the, the, mm -hmm. the eldest daughter, that the government, the FBI, and the New York Police Department had a lot to do yeah. with, yeah. you know, they made it possible for them to kill, mm -hmm. you know, Malcolm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in addition, because of my speeches, I, I haven't shared this with anybody. So the, the Egyptian students be the first one to hear this. But uh, actually, for a little while, the FBI was following me. I'm sure. Because I would look on, you know how when you look on your, on your phone and if somebody is uh, next to you or near you at the airport, you will see their, their name of whatever their site is or mm -hmm. you know, whatever their hot spot is. Well, I kept getting FBI <laughs> hotspots. Wow. Yeah, different places because mm -hmm. of, of my speeches and what I had to say. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, and I said, if you're listening to me, I am unfiltered so you can listen away, you know, so I didn't care, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah. and then especially when my ex-wife, uh, who we're still close and still talk all the time, when she became a Congresswoman. Yeah. So I know that they want to know what she's saying to me and what, you know, what I have to do with the new gun bills and, and everything mm -hmm. that, that are coming out. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just, you just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that you have to navigate, you know, when you have death and especially someone as big and as an icon like Malcolm X, you have to navigate all the things that are going to come at you. And they mm -hmm. always try to separate Malcolm from, Martin Luther King, but they were the best of friends. Mm -hmm. You know, the family said the families used to come over each other's house. But see, the right. government didn't want to have MLK associate with Malcolm. That's the, the key, mm -hmm. because they would feel that that would strengthen what Malcolm had to say. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they didn't want. And of course, when they find out later on, they'll find out that the government had to do with the death of Martin Luther King also. Oh, yeah. It's oh, not yeah. just Malcolm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Davis, I wanted to let you know that President Richie Adoni had to leave for another engagement, but he extended to you a personal invitation to visit, visit us here in Cairo, and that your talk was very riveting, that he was very sad and he needed to leave, but um, he enjoyed the talk and, and the exchange we're now having. Uh, but again, due to another engagement, he needed to leave. So, okay. um, so I wanted to let you be aware of that. I think what we can do now, uh, I gather we can close. Um, 
Dr. Butlazar, uh, would you like to make some closing comments? And, and I gather before you do, uh, Mr. Davis, once again, thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, I must say that I had the double treat to not only see the link on Tuesday, but to also moderate this wonderful discussion with you today. I do hope that we will be able to cross paths uh, face to face, uh, certainly once uh, this global pandemic uh, becomes uh, less threatening, uh, that perhaps we can uh, meet each other. I wish you much continued success with your global efforts uh, for international human rights. And, and that again, I do hope that we will see each other um, in the future. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you, very nice meeting you. Absolutely wonderful. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Professor Jones for doing an excellent job navigating our discussion um, for, um, for, for all that you've done for us, preparing for today, right? Um, Ron Davis, it was an honor having you on campus and I really hope that you will be able to visit Cairo in person um, once the pandemic is over. Also, thank you for, I, I think people don't know how much time you've put into tonight's talk, like how many times we've met before, how many discussions we had, but um, just like how generous you were towards us, like, you know, dedicating not just a few hours, but, but entire days to preparing for today. Um, I just want to briefly sort of, um, I'll keep it brief, but I want to sort of talk about the conference, right? Um, I've learned a, a hell of a lot um, these last two days, right? Um, and, and part of it is like just how painful it is to, to talk about human rights right now, like how painful it can be, right? Um, I think when I was um, listening to Dr. Swift's um, talk yesterday, I had a moment where I felt like, how, how dare I ask anybody to talk about human rights, right? It almost felt, it felt like an act of cruelty sometimes, like to make people sort of talk about, reflect on human rights, because it can look, um, it, it, can, it can look really dark, right? Um, but, but, but then I was, I was thinking about Rebecca Solnit's book, um, Hope in Dark Times, where she reflects on like all the different struggles she was a part of, right? And how they sort of all ended up in defeat, right? But at the end of the day, she says like, there are there all these connections that come out of them, right? Um, like, you know, people started thinking about, you know, things differently, but, you know, connections that were made here today or yesterday, um, I, th I saw connections between all the different panelists on, on there. Um, you know, they can be academic, they can be activists, right? Um, but I, but I, but I'm, I think I like to think about this conference as sort of um, a place where people got to meet and, and start conversations, right? And it, they won't end here, but I hopefully will, you know, continue hereafter. Um, if people met somebody at the conference and need to have their info, email me and I'll, I'll be happy to get you in touch with um, Mr. Davis or, you know, anybody else who you felt like you would like to reconnect. I, I'd be happy to make those connections. And um, yeah, thanks. Um, I know everybody's really exhausted at this point, like especially people who were here both days. Um, um, yeah, thank, thank you for all you did for to make this conference um, such a sort of fruitful endeavor and um, get some rest, everybody. Thank you. I'm getting a little emotional right now. <laughs> uh, that's good, that's good. Emotions are good. <laughs> yeah, they're good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.